to the GLOW podcast. I'm here with Beth Sacknoff, who is an herbalist. She works with parents of um, all different postpartum ranges and then all the way into to later parenthood. And she's speaking with us today about her practice, her job, and about herbs to support our health. Beth, welcome. Thank you. Where are you right now? I am in Kensington, which is north of North Berkeley. It's a little town I did not even know it existed, and I grew up in San Francisco. Okay, amazing. Well, I um, spend my time in the Bay Area in El Cerrito, so I am very familiar with Kensington um, and fell in love with it. I actually wanted to live in Kensington first, so that's awesome. So we are based in Oakland, California, um, and we have a friend in common who's actually a colleague of mine, um, massage therapist Kristen DuPont, who's a glow, an incredible glow massage therapist. Um, so she introduced us, and I'm so happy to be able to connect with you about this and to offer you as a resource to our clients through your practice, which is Wild Child Apothecary. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do in wild child yeah I would love to yeah so um, in my business I support um, mamas mostly in the postpartum period in the early postpartum phases like the zero to five um, postpartum age range and um, a lot of the mamas that I'm working with are going through a lot of like sleep deprivation they're burnt out they're exhausted they're overwhelmed um, and so I work to help them bring more nourishment into their lives through the plants to really help them have more energy, to feel more connected to themselves, to feel more present in their parenting, um, and to really work on this sense of balance. Like, how do I bring balance into my life now that I'm a parent or a newer parent um, and all the things that I'm constantly juggling? And I do that by connecting them with the plants um, through one-on-one -on -one herbal work with them, as well as through classes. The thing I love to do is really talk about the plants. Um, so I do that in a lot of group class forms. Mm -hmm. I love that. I remember um, the first time that I really, like I had an experience when I was in my late teens um, where I got to like really commune with plants. And it was a moment that I honestly feel it was through plant medicine, um, through psychedelic plant medicine. And I honestly feel like it was the beginning of my entire career. And I feel so lucky that I actually had that experience at such a young age, relatively speaking, um, and that it was in the context of like a deeper dive as opposed to just like an escape and like a party experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's powerful so, medicine very powerful medicine. Tell us how outside of like magic mushrooms, tell us how um, you're using plant medicine. What does that mean to you and how literally how are people ingesting it, putting it on their skin? How is it working? Yeah, that's a big question. And the first thing I think of too is I like to think of working with plant medicine as opposed to like using plant medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Because the way that I work and the herbal medicine that I practice is really holistic in that I'm really working with the plants to help me bring about change on a whole person scale, as opposed to just looking at the symptoms I'm experiencing. Because the symptoms to me are information, right? They're helping me figure out what's going on at a deeper level and what's at the root. And so the way that I do that truly is by like making it a daily part of my life. Um, first and foremost is just like spending time with nature, connecting with nature. That um, is a challenge sometimes. Also when you have kids, when you have little ones, what pre-kids, like to me connecting with nature is like going backpacking. But now it means like opening my door and like noticing five shades of green every day, right? It's like realizing that nature and connection with plants is still accessible to me, even if I'm not leaving my home, even if I'm not leaving my neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. And so connecting to that really like soul- quality of um, like energetic medicine through the plants and just being around them is one way I do that on a daily basis. The mm -hmm. other thing I do on a daily basis is drink a shit ton of tea. Like, so I, my totally. goal is a quart of tea a day um, and really working with the plants that are like high in my vitamins and minerals. And to me, these are like food. Um, and the other thing I do is I generally have like tincture bottles, which are herbs extracted in alcohol throughout my house. So like mm -hmm. in my kitchen, I have uh, tinctures of herbs that are specific for digestion. By my bed is ones that are more for sleep. So just making it um, like now and all during the winter, I generally have ones that are more like cold and flu based, like in the kitchen where I am most frequently. So um, making it really easy so I don't have to think too hard. Like the things I need are where I need them most. And so it's so much easier to incorporate it on a day-to-day -day level. Um, and the other thing I do is also like in bring herbs into my cooking. So whether that's yeah. like powdered herbs, like in my smoothies, in um, I'm really into like nut butter ball energy bites. So I throw herbs into like anything I can in a powdered form. 
and also cooking herbs into my broth is another way. I just, I just told you like 26 different ways I like to work with the herbs, but generally mm-hmm. I'm just trying to incorporate it as me- best as I can to just my daily routines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's sort of like the broader energetic experience is what I'm hearing. And then there are these more um, integrated ways. So through your food, et cetera, and then you're and then you have these more concentrated forms. Um, and and those might be more specific. And it sounds like that might be a, pl- a time and um, when somebody might be coming to someone like you, an expert, because we, of course, can all make our tinctures, we can all work with plant medicine. Uh, but the reality is that in our culture, we've really lost a lot of of that knowledge, um, which there was a lot of, we, I I think, especially people who come from um, like an Anglo background, think of, um, and a European background generally, think of herbal medicine as being something that belongs to other cultures. Um, And herbal medicine is interesting from what I understand about it, because it actually does come, we have a Western herbal um, canon that has been used for generations that we've also lost um, within yeah. our own, you know, within that heritage. Um, so how did you find it? How did you find your way kind of back to this? Yeah. Well, I, I want to say too, something that really struck, struck me, what you were saying is that I, a lot of times I like to mention is that one of the, the powerful things about herbal medicine is it is in all of our blood. It is an ancestral tradition that all of our like great, great grandmothers were practicing mm-hmm. by just taking care of themselves and their families, really using the plants around them. And this is one way to really connect back to that like innate wisdom that we all have and are able to unlock. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the way I found out about it is I'm someone who likes to like make and create things. And maybe like 10 years ago, um, I always had a love for herb shops and like glass bottles and like just plants in, in interesting formations. And so, um, the shop Scarlet Sage in San Francisco, I lived by and, and went to frequently. And I picked up a book by, um, one of like the, I think of her as a fairy godmother of Western herbalism and that's Rosemary Gladstar and her book was filled with recipes. And so for me, it was a really great way to like work with the plants hands on in a way that really connected to me. And then it kind of opened up a portal to be like, okay, this is no longer just an interest, just a passion, just a hobby. I really want to um, understand this and explore it and support my family and my community and myself with this form of well-being. Yeah, it really, it's clearly you've made it your life's work. That's, I can relate to that. Um, I can relate to the feeling of uh, an initial interest getting sparked and then it kind of like takes over as like, you know, it just doesn't end. Um, yeah. We, I've frequently recommended and read myself um, the herbal for the childbearing year. Is that the Rosemary Gladstar one? I think it is. I want to say Susan Weed. Okay. Yeah. Susan Weed has a lot of books as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was really, that was formative for me in understanding the place of herbs in, um, prenatal and postpartum wellness. And it's just a primer. It's like very basic. What was your prenatal care? What was your prenatal self-care? What did that look like? That's such a good question. So I have two little ones. I have a one-year-old and four-year-old and my prenatal care looked really different between the two of them. Um, And I'll say when I got pregnant with my first, I was in my second year of uh, clinical herb school. And so I had been learning a lot about the plants. And so herbal medicine was a big piece of the way I took care of myself because I was studying it and it was such a specific way to live it. Um, and I'll say like during my first pregnancy, I was really focused on like what in a book told me was the right way to care for myself meant like trying to eat really healthy and taking all these herbs, but it didn't always resonate. And so there are ways in which I wasn't trusting my body and like my Mm -hmm. own experience of the foods that actually fueled me, right? Which a lot of times were really simple. They were simple carbs. And instead I was, I'm a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian since I was 10. And so all of a sudden to only want bread and pasta was something so unfamiliar to me that I was like, this can't be right. Um, and so fast forward to the, with my second baby, I was way more just in tune with my body, with my needs and not judging those and really kind of accepting them. And, um, also like I knew which plants I really resonated with and felt to be really nourishing to me. So plants like red raspberry leaf and nettles and oats, plants that are really high and rich in vitamins and minerals that my body was clearly craving because it wanted a lot of those things. Um, 
Let me think. And other things prenatally, I mean, it was just really like learning to listen to my body was a big part of that experience. The other, other thing, but big difference was that I started drinking bone broth and I'm still a vegetarian, but I'm a vegetarian that totally gets down with bone broth. So that was a really big shift for me to listen to like, my body wants more nutrients and I'm not getting it from my diet. So um, being able to just kind of trust my body has been a big learning experience. And it was a really big difference between my first and my second pregnancy. The, the idea of intuitive eating is so important to our well-being generally because of the, the symphony of hormones that govern women's health, pregnant or not. And if you're not responding to what is happening because our hormones are shifting throughout a day, a week, a year, a lifetime, then you're really missing some significant cues. Um, and again, this sort of goes back to this like knowledge that we've lost um, that would have been passed down about how we eat and care for ourselves and support ourselves even over the course of a month. Um, so, and I do see having worked with pregnancy for a long time now, I do see people who would otherwise not be really open to, interested in, available um, for this kind of input, like their intuitive input, not me yeah. telling them, hey, you need to eat this, um, that it can open people up to it a little bit more. So um, that's, it's, it's always really cool to hear from experts in a field about how they had their own journeys to reawakening or to going deeper and learning more through their own physical experiences and mental emotional experiences. Um, yeah, it's also been like a really big piece for me on the postpartum side as well, because mm -hmm. I think it's just parenting is all about intuition, right? It's really all about trusting what your instinct is when it comes to your family, your well-being and your children and learning to be, I think, especially learning to be an advocate. Mm -hmm. And that so much has to do with like, what is my gut? What is my heart telling me? And so that's been a big learning piece as well of supporting myself and parents through that idea of like, how do we cultivate intuition? How do we cultivate our instincts when we're being so, um, we're being fed a lot of information all the time, right? And so when we're trying, I'm, I'm a Pisces, which means I'm really watery. I like to get a lot of information and to like go with the flow and it can be hard for me to make decisions. And so that's mm -hmm. definitely one of the muscles that I'm continuing to like always practice this idea of like coming back to intuition, especially as a parent. It's massive. And I see that start with people in at the very beginning of pregnancy. It's like you become a parent the minute that you conceive. And let's just say you're not even doing like a conscious conception thing, because frankly, just most people are not right. Right. Um, and, and so, okay, lo and behold, you're knocked up. And then, and, and you've either been trying um, or you haven't, and then you you immediately have to make decisions about your care, your prenatal care. Do I eat this? Do I not eat that? And that is, it, it's all, um, it's, it's understanding what you need. And it's also understanding your own risk tolerances. It's about making decisions. And again, you're absolutely right. There's just so much information out there. I mean, I didn't read any parenting books at all. I was like, I don't even want to, I don't want to go there. I don't want to I just don't need that. I don't need more of that. You know, we're good here. Um, and, and I'm really glad, like when I look around now, I feel like I was like a teenager, you know, I had a baby at 30 in my community. That was like, I was like a tween, you know? Um, <laughs> and so, and I'm kind of glad because I didn't have, most of my friends weren't having kids yet. Mm. So I didn't have like all this input coming in and I'm really glad, you know? Um, now the downside of that, of all of this is that as you just mentioned, postpartum is where we see this huge dearth of support and information. And because nobody knows that they need to care, you yes. just don't even know that you need to care until you're in it. And then it's like, you feel like you're already drowning and it's too late. How and would you I recommend? Think yeah. it's, it's also postpartum, especially the early, I mean, and I call like early postpartum really the first year. I'm not just saying the first six weeks or, you know, mm -hmm. 40 days, but I think it's so much harder to like even consciously sift through the information, like your um, hormones and your emotions are so different and your everything's so new, but like you, you don't have the time or the mental capacity to like, I mean, even I remember with my first baby, like finding a lactation consultant was so much harder um, just because I didn't have that capacity and understanding and ability to like sift through information the way I did when I was pregnant and like reading books and like getting prepared. But I, I didn't actually prepare for the things I needed, which was for my own well-being and to nurture. How, how am I going to nurture myself while my full job is nurturing this tiny little human?
it is so incredibly important. And I, um, my midwife, one of my midwives for my first um, said to me as, as she was sort of like starting to retire, she was like, I just, honestly, it's not even birth. She's like, it's just postpartum. It's so intense. And I'm, she's like, I just need a break from it because you go into someone's home and she calls it the murky time. Mm. She's like, cause you're, that's the murky time, you know? And it's so right. It's like, you go in, it's like, you can't really see right. The whole vibration in the house feels different. Not bad. Just everything shifts. Time is weird. Is there, what even is time? You know, it's like, honestly, I feel like quarantine has been like a total revisiting to the postpartum period for me personally. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it does resemble it. And I know for me, I was just coming out of my baby cave and then um, we went into quarantine. And so I was like, oh, back in this place that I was really excited and ready to come out of. And so that's been like a really interesting struggle point for me currently. I bet it has. Yeah, that's exactly right. You're like, ee, ooh, just kidding. Er, er, yeah. er, yeah. Like back it right up. Yeah, mm-hmm. back into the garage. Well, what are you doing for yourself? What can we do? Tell us about postpartum herbs, especially for anxiety. Why don't we just start with that? Because that's yeah. something that's just so massive, depression and anxiety, you know, mm-hmm. talk to us. Yeah. One of the first herbs I think of for the postpartum period is holy basil. Um, It's also known as Tulsi, and it's an herb coming out of the Ayurvedic medicine tradition where like for thousands of years, it's been really considered this sacred plant. Um, There's a lot of reasons I think of it, and it was the first one that really came to mind. When we are like sleep deprived and really struggling to function, um, because even though we may be, be postpartum, we might be on some sort of Eternity leave, um, we're still like, there's still expectations in terms of our functioning, right? We still need to be conversational with other people. Um, there's still ways that we need to operate in this world. And so, holy basil is one that I think of, and I go back and forth, I'll say holy basil and Tulsi mm-hmm. um, for a few reasons. So, one is it's an adaptogen, which means that it's supporting our body in um, being more resilient to stress. Right, and so it's nourishing and supporting the endocrine system, which is our hormone producing system in the body. So that's really important because we are experiencing elevated um, hormones are going up and down and we're likely experiencing more stress as we're learning to parent, right? As we're learning to parent this new baby. Um, But specifically, it's really nourishing um, to the brain. So it's sending blood flow to the brain. And so after uh, not sleeping so well and you still need to function in the world, you're trying to put together like coherent sentences. I mean, this whole year I've been drinking Tulsi like every day. Like, right now I've had about a week of really crappy sleep. So to me, like the first herb I think of is like, okay, I need Tulsi every morning just to like give me that sort of um, oxygen and blood flow to my brain that's really hard when you haven't had like a four hour solid window of sleep in days. The other reason I really love, there's like two other main things that are coming to mind. One is it's considered a galactagog. And so a galactagog is the herbal action for um, a plant that helps promote lactation. So that's a really good one to think of if you're nursing or breastfeeding or pumping. Um, it's not like the, the, the plant that I go to first for someone who is um, having low produ- milk production or just trying to boost supply, but it's certainly one that will help to enrich and kind of support lactation. Mm-hmm. The last reason I really like it is, um, wait, there's one more. I need to be drinking my Tulsi so I can remember it right now. Uh Um, It has an uplifting quality to it. So a lot of the plants that I work with are ones that support the nervous system to really bring about more soothing and calming and grounding. And that's great when you have like a new crying baby and like you're, you're navigating changes in your life. But sometimes what you need is more of a uplifting quality mm-hmm. um, on days where you're feeling blue or depressed or just exhausted and fatigued. Tulsi has a really nice sense of this more of like energetic lift um, and kind of more positivity that you're bringing to yourself and to your surrounding. So mm-hmm. that's the first one I think about. It's an amazing all arounder. I feel yeah. like this is an MVP of postpartum herbs. You basically yes. just like answered all the things. Okay. So it takes care of, it helps support lactation yeah. mood. We'll like lump it under mood. So mm-hmm. both in calming and uplifting, which is mm-hmm. like what we're all looking for. That sounds all order one of those. Um, and sleep and sleep is so incredibly crucial. If we're in a moment where you're, and by a moment, I mean like 
weeks on end, sometimes yeah. months, where yeah. you just are not able to get enough sleep. And you know, there's there's so many things that we can try to do to augment that. We can we can try different kinds of sleep training. We can try napping during the day. But but the reality is that once you have a baby, once you're brain changes and your nervous system shifts with the hormones of pregnancy and postpartum, you are going, your sleep will sort of never be the same again. You know, um, it helps you relate to your, you know, birth parent thinking like, well, got it. That's why I would come in the front door and like, or I would open the garage on the other side of the house and like, suddenly there'd be a person there like, hi, yeah, I woke up. And you're like, mm-hmm. how did you do that? Because your brain never changes, you know, never goes back. So um, what do we do when um, we're postpartum and sleep is just such a struggle, whether it's difficulty actually going to sleep um, or difficulty staying asleep? And are those things, the treatments different, the treatments, yeah. the support herbs? Yeah. That's been a really big question too to unpack. So the first thing I want to say too is like this sense of, I want to say hypervigilance, right? Like when you become a parent and there's been some studies, right? About like whoever the primary parent is, that part of their brain, that sort of vigilance is activated and enlarged. And because we live in a culture where like the support system for usually the mom or whoever is the primary parent is you're kind of considered you're on your own, right? You're, often there's one parent working and there's one person parenting. And that's kind of considered to be like their, their support structure in terms of them being able to feel comfortable and to feel safe to like letting go the fear of like baby's taken care of, I'm taken care of. I think that that relates a lot to the inability to like fall into sleep because we don't have these support structures so that we can relax and feel nurtured and cared for so we can do the primary parent can be the, do the job of taking care of this child. And so instead we're always activating, we're always on, we're always like pulling up cortisol. So I think part of the job first and foremost is like, who is your community, right? Like where is your, your structure and your, your support system so that you can actually like release some of that. Because until you have that, we're just kind of fighting against, like, it's always me. I'm always on. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing I'll say, too, is there's a couple ways I think about it. One is what plants can you work with to support really calming down and in the evening time unwinding? So one of the plants I think of is chamomile, right? And so chamomile is one of these calm, soothing plants that folks are generally familiar with. And I would say familiar is a good thing. You know, just because it's common does not mean it is not powerful, right? There's a reason this plant has been used for, by so many people for so long. And it really does support the nervous system to like soothe and release tension. Um, it's also really family friendly safe. So it's a nice one to think of for like kids who are having a hard time unwinding. It's anti-inflammatory, anti-spasmodic. It's one I think of if there's sort of colic and if there's like a crying baby and you can't figure out what's going on, it's not just that like baby needs help and support. It's like the parent's going to need support and help because it is um, pulling on all of your stress hormones to go through that experience together. So chamomile is a really nice one to have for the parent and for baby. Um, one nice way to transfer it is through breast milk, but you can always give like little sips of tea to a kid or even little squirts of tincture um, working with it in a bath. But my recommendation, if you're struggling to fall asleep in the evening, like maybe you're having this feeling of tired but wired, which is really common. A lot of the mamas I work with are like, I'm so exhausted and I still can't fall asleep. Um, and so to me, that means like, what are you doing in the First, what, what's your support structure like? But second, like, what are you doing in the hour before bed to help you unwind? And so we all have these habits that we need to break. Um, and it's hard to set limits around like, this is my only time for myself and I want to be on my phone and I want to watch Netflix. But like, if sleep is your priority, then actually make it a priority and like guard that time before bed. Um, So I like to recommend an hour before bed, making a cup of something like chamomile tea, um, taking maybe like most of it before bed, about an hour. And you can also do something called pulse dosing, which means you're taking it a little bit of it an hour before bed, and then maybe like 20 minutes before bed, and then right before. To me, that's easier to do with a tincture, which is herb extracted in alcohol, because you're just taking like a squirt of a tincture bottle. So about 60 minutes before bed, 20 minutes before bed, right before. So you're getting a decent amount of the plant into your body at different intervals to really support that message of like, it's time to unwind and soothe and get ready for bed. And then it would be processed in a longer um, window as well. And when you, um, 
when you recommend tinctures, do you recommend um, just directly in the mouth? Yeah. Yeah, that's my recommendation. If if the flavor is off-putting, uh, most often tincture is going to be an alcohol extract base. And if you can't get down with that, another good idea is to put it in a cup of water. If you put it in hot water and like just give it a good stir, a good percent of the alcohol will dissipate. And so that way you're getting less of that strong alcohol taste. Great to know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, those are, so we have chamomile and we have Tulsi, which mm -hmm. are with to support sleep and to be grounding and generally. I really appreciate what you were saying about your support structure mm -hmm. um, and just a really fun fact on this. So the same part of the brain that is that enlarges for hypervigilance is also the part of the brain that enlarges for attachment. Mm. And it turns out that as a non-birth parent, now this study was done on men, but let's circle back to the non-birth parent. Okay, right? But first let's say so the study was done on men. There've been a couple studies um, that the same part of the brain enlarges with contact with a yes. child. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and so now I want to do like, I want all the studies. I'm like, wait, so how does that apply? Like, do I, I have to imagine women's brains do too? You know what I mean? I don't think it's like just in men. It's just that like, they, that wasn't who they decided, like who was included in the sample size, um, like same sex parents. But I, I'm so fascinated by that. And I know in my case, my, um, oldest, my husband, um, she's my birth child. Um, but my husband adopted her when we got, you know, after we'd been together for a while and like for sure, I will just go ahead and say I'm not the favorite. <laughs> and it's like, it's deeper than just like, I'm not as fun. It's like, it's an attachment thing. And it's for both of them. I think I'm not either of their favorites. That's okay. Um, but it's, um, it's just such an interesting thing. And, and really the reason why I explain that is not just because it's a fun little like piece of trivia. It's because it shows that if you were to spread the burden, I'll use that word, of, um, of, of like the stress mm -hmm. element that comes with being responsible for someone else's life, you, uh, another person actually can absorb some of that. And it does, it does make the, um, not, neither person needs to be as stressed out. Like, I think there's this idea that like, well, that I'm going to be stressed about this and you be stressed about this, you know, like specializing. And I don't think that that, I agree with you. I'm with you. Yeah, no, I agree. There's, um, there's a, an organization called, I think it's innate traditions and they're doing a whole lot of work around postpartum care and like really training people on these know. different postpartum care modules. And, um, there's a term that I heard them use called revillaging, right. And just like, what can we do as parents to like revillage, to reform these structures so that we have more support, especially during this like really precious postpartum period. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wish that there were just, you know, it's so hard with like resources available within all different kinds of communities. And the fact that postpartum care can be so expensive mm -hmm. because we aren't villaged mm -hmm. instead, it's become a professional model. Everything is privatized. I mean, we could do a whole other, <laughs> we could do a whole other segment on this. We should probably just have tea. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, Awesome, Beth. I want to talk to you for the rest of my life, but let's uh, we'll wrap it up. We'll keep talking then. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I want to touch on one more thing. Can we please yeah. talk about sex drive? I want to talk about that because I think that that is something um, that also in this sort of like archetypal idea of these traditional monogamous, um, like long-term monogamous um, heterosexual relationships, it's like women are like, oh, I, I like pushing it off, pushing it off when, when actually I don't see that that is entirely how this, how this works and the expectations that we have on women to physically be prepared for different kinds of not just intercourse, but like just body stimulation mm -hmm. um, can be really challenging in that postpartum window. What are your thoughts on, on all of that? And then how do herbs intersect with that? And your answer is not, I do not expect it to only pertain to herbs. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would say like, when I think about this, when I'm working with folks who are having, um, they're just libido isn't there, right. Or they're just having a hard time connecting with like, in terms of intimacy and sex, it really is a more holistic approach that I want to take. It's not like what herbs are going to get you going. It's like, what is going on underneath this? Is it because, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're all day with a baby and you don't have any time for yourself and you don't feel connected to that piece of yourself anymore. 
Is it um, your mind is just constantly thinking about um, different stresses or things going on at work? Is it, you know, there's a whole lot of different things to think about that aren't just like hormonal, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to influence the approach that I'm going to take in terms of what herbs am I using? Is it just hormonal balancing? Is it herbs that are going to be more circulatory stimulating so that you're bringing blood flow and energy and oxygen to the reproductive, reproductive organs? Um, is it more of thinking about connecting with your heart, right? Like connecting back to yourself to find that moment of what do I want? What do I need right now? Um, and leading from there. There are some really good herbs that I think of that kind of do those different things, right? So we talked about some that are more like that soothing and calming um, herbal remedies that might be supporting, right? Because the first thing when I think about libido, libido is like, are you present, right? Are you able to like tap into yourself? Are you like calm and grounded, right? So getting your chamomile and your holy basil and, and, and whatever herbs that those are for you. Um, there are some that I think of that are more like reproductive tonics that are considered to be more stimulating for libido. One is shatavari. That's one in particular I really like with, like to, to work with. It's also my favorite galactagogue. So mm. it's also a really nice one for mamas who are nursing and breastfeeding. Um, it, that's my favorite go-to actually for um, increasing breast milk supply. But it also has a really nice affinity for the reproductive system. And so any herbs that are increasing circulation are going to be nice when you're trying to increase stimulation and increase libido. So um, I think of like cacao um, or things that are spicy, right? Like cayenne, um, pepper, like things that are, um, bringing blood flow to the body are going to be helpful. Um, there's another herb that has been for a long time is kind of considered a, um, libido herb or for stimulation and that's Damiana. It's mm -hmm. one that I don't recommend though. If you're nursing, it's not one that I think is nursing safe or for pregnancy as well. So, um, and that one is also doing, it's a really nice nervine, which means it's supporting the nervous system. So doing that relaxing, kind of calming, soothing, but also bringing blood flow and energy to the reproductive system. So that's one you can think of if you're not pregnant or nursing. Um, those are the main ones that kind of come to mind. Amazing. What was the one that you said was your favorite galactagogue? I don't think I've ever heard of it. Chatavari. And so that's one, Chatavari, it's a fun one to say. Yeah. It's also an Ayurvedic herb. So coming out of the Ayurvedic medicine tradition, yeah. um, traditionally it's always, it's been used with um, combination with fat. So um, mm -hmm. my favorite way to use it is as like a powder and put it into, to make kind of like a, like a nut milk latte with it or to sprinkle it into like nut butter balls is a nice way to work with it, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because you're bringing extra nutrient, like extra fat into your body. And so that's going to be really helpful as well for, um, for milk flow and production. Right. So it does two things. It allows the actual chemical transfer of the, the potent, like the chemical that you're adding, right. That comes from like the, the, content from the herb right and mm -hmm. also is giving you the extra calories some extra calories that you need that's awesome I love that um it sounds like a very holistic um herb that it mm -hmm. and and sort of intake method yeah. um awesome Beth thank you so much can you tell us more about where we can find you on social media and your website and do you do distance consultations Tell yeah. us those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, my business is called Wild Child Apothecary and that's my handles on Instagram. Um, and you can find me as well over on Facebook. If you search my name um, through Beth Sacknoff or through Wild Child Apothecary, um, that's also my website as well. And yeah, I work with folks one-on-one. -on -one. I do it all over the phone. And then um, I just usually use mail to send out personalized and custom medicine. And then I do a variety of different classes through like Facebook lives or through Zoom online. So distance co consultations is kind of my jam. Amazing. Where did you go to school? Um, I started at um, Ohlone, uh, which changed their name in Berkeley. And, um, and I finished up my clinical Western program over at Ancestral Apothecary in Oakland. Okay, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I have a feeling there'll be some people who are interested um, budding um, herbalists yeah. who are watching this. Awesome, Definitely. Beth. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. You too.